bear hug, you're pushing this way. You, you, if you're doing it to cause internal rotation, right? So, you do that. So, yeah, so you're pushing here, and then also you're pushing here, right? So on the ipsilateral ASIS or the contralateral shoulder, it's all active. It's all active. And then I won't ask you about this, but they do what's called the belly press test, and now they actually measure the amount of force. You know, they put a little uh, force transducer between your belly and your hand to see how much force you can produce with internal rotation. And then we had the lift off test. And remember, by the way, when you look at the EMG studies, and so this is very important for exercising and testing, when you're, and this is subscapularis we're talking about here, for this subscap, from a 90 degrees scaption position, internal rotation, more force comes from the subscap and less force comes from all the other muscles. And so that's a great way to test and strengthen. And this is what I have people do regularly. You take a TheraBand, you put it over the top of a door. I do it myself, to myself, by the way, because uh, my shoulders are garbage. Um, so from this position, you internally rotate. I'm pulling down as I'm doing this. So by the way, i got a patient right now thinking he was doing the right thing. What he was doing, he was holding a weight in this position and doing this. And so what are you doing when you're doing this? Well, you're contracting your deltoid and you're sliding the rotator cuff tendons underneath the coracochromial arch. And what does the deltoid do? It slams the humerus into the coracochromial really aggravated his supraspinatus tendon, and so now you know, he can't use his shoulders, so let's get fixed. And in fact, you know, they thought it might be, this is another one of the examples, they thought it might be torn. They did an MRI. It's completely intact, it's just really inflamed. You know, so, so you see, you're doing the same movement, but the difference is when you're doing it for the, super, the subscapularis, I'm pulling down. I'm not pulling up. I'm pulling down for them. So the gym is you push the arm in or they no, can't do they, that? They can't do this. So if you have them attain this position, put the hand on the other shoulder, bring the elbow to the chest. And scapula fracture, fracture is it radial deviation or ulnar deviation? The test itself is ulnar deviation. And they report pain like this. Now they sometimes also have pain with radial deviation. You don't like that? Does it fit? <laughs> Anything else? The isometric flexion test? Mm -hmm. Isometric flexion test, yes. Uh, uh, isometric flexion test. So what's the for? That's for the, for the yeah. um, deformity, protraction retraction, is that it? No. no. It's, it's just where you oh, go like this. Oh, yeah. The scapula, that's what it is. But thank you. So th this is for the serratus anterior. Thanks very much. Yeah. 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 So his arm is at 90 degrees flexion. And I'm looking at the scapula. So you palpate the scapula anywhere. It doesn't matter where you palpate it. And so now I say, don't let me move you. I push down. And what should happen is the scapula should be stable as can be. And it might even abduct a little bit. That's normal for the scapula to abduct because serratus anterior is stabilizing it. If your serratus anterior is weak or paralyzed, the scapula shoots superiorly because the upper trap pulls it up. But there's nothing to kind of hold it down because your serratus anterior. And this is dramatic when it's present. And in fact, that's what, what I do with patients when I'm monitoring them over time, is I'll you know, see how it changes over time. Always checking that when they come in the office. Mm -hmm. because, you know, you never know. We do the crank test. Crank test. Uh, yeah. uh, it could be supine. It doesn't matter. See the supine. So we're going to do it from anywhere from in these regions, these regions, and all the way up to here. Again, some of them even lower, depending on the kind of labrum tear that you have. And basically what you do is, the, it's called crank, because the form is like a crank. I'm going to rotate back and forth after I push the humerus into the glenoid. So I'm taking, causing compression of the humerus against the glenoid, and I'm testing them in a whole variety of different positions. And I'm looking for a clunk, and clicks, and pain. Okay. And so that... As we describe that, in all those variety of positions, that encompasses like seven or eight different orthopedic tests that all have different names that we're not having to learn because we're doing this broad approach to the crank test, sometimes called the um, compression rotation test. Good name for it because that's what we're doing, compressing and rotating. But again, it all fits in that same category. Questions? Yes. Can you give a jerk test? Jerk test. 
So this is for posterior instability. And so it's not dissimilar from the crank test. Okay, I'm going to compress the uh, glenohumeral joint by pushing along the shaft of the humerus, but instead of rotating, I'm going to horizontally adduct and abduct. And again, when you're doing that, nice and smooth movement. So the jerk, again, is not the person. The jerk is that suddenly it jerks across a uh, torn piece of labor. You don't have that nice smooth movement. So notice what I'm doing as I go through this, I'm always pushing toward the glenoid. So my direction of force changes so that I'm always compressing the humerus into the glenoid. So again, that's another compression, well we're not rotation, but it's a compression test for labrum tear. So here we're specifically testing for posterior labrum, therefore posterior stability. And we can do that seated too, right? To support the back of the catheter. If you're, yeah, if you're sit sitting in a chair probably, it'd be a little hard to do otherwise. It, it typically does support. This is an active test, so I'll just show you. So you have your patients do these things. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good to do them all. Yeah. So, so this is for impingement syndrome. And so remember, internal rotation, when I abduct, the greater tubercle stops the movement, so I can't go any further. So if the tissues attach the greater tubercle, antispinatus, supraspinatus, or teres minor, yeah, uh, have irritation or inflammation, that'll cause pain. It's normal that it's restricted. It's not normal for it to cause pain. Then when they externally rotate, they can go a lot further, and that's normal, but the pain's not there. And so that's the positive sign com combination of those two findings. Pain with internal rotation, no pain, and greater range with external rotation. So for instance, if I just had a deltoid strain, it's going to hurt in both positions. You know, this is specifically for impingement syndrome. And remember, for the lock non lock test in particular, it's not sensitive for bicep tendon causes of impingement syndrome because the bicep tendon with internal rotation is not between the humerus and the coracoperoneal arch. Okay. Anything else? Passive extension test. Passive extension test. Yes, it's increasing that way. So now this is for bicep tendonitis. Turn on this side. So uh, now here's a couple interesting things. So here's just kind of go with this. If I externally rotate, I'll stretch the bicep tendon more. But if I pronate, I'll stretch the bicep tendon more. So how do I externally rotate and pronate? It's kind of hard to do, you know, with the elbow straight. So typically it's done in, in external rotation. Forget the pronation part of it. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the arm as far as it goes. So I'm taking to the end of passive range of motion and say, does that hurt? And then I'm going to bend the elbow and take them back as far as they can go. If they have bicep tendonitis, so let's go back a step. Normally, what limits motion is the anterior capsule. And if it's the anterior capsule, then the range will be the same in either case. But when I have an irritated, inflamed, and uh, degenerative and contracted bicep tendon, then with the elbow straight, that's going to stretch it and it's going to hurt, limit range of motion. But with the elbow bent, there's going to be greater range and less pain. So that's the finding with the passive extension test, is that with the elbow straight, there's pain and restriction. But with the elbow bent, there's greater range and less pain. And that indicates biceps tendinopathy. Best way to say it. Anything else? So he's got, he's got a deformity here. We have a retract and protract. If it's an NC separation with a true step deformity, when he retracts, it diminishes. When he protracts, it increases. And that helps me to identify the step deformity and distinguish it from AC arthritis or simply a knobby clavicle. Can you say it decreases when they protract? It the decreases when they retract. Yeah. And so then think about it. Again, what happens when I retract my scapula elevates, when I protract, it can depress. Now, they have to be relaxed. Again, especially in early ones, they'll contract their upper traps because it hurts. In which case, you won't be able to tell because it really won't be doing that. 
but when they can completely relax and let the shoulder fall, that's when you see these hardness. What does that differentiate from? So if it doesn't move? So it, if there's no change, then it's either AC arthritis or just a knobby clavicle. It's part of what makes you you. It's what makes you unique. And what makes you unique makes you you. There wouldn't be any pain with that. It'd just be differentiating between the best one. There may be pain. And in fact, yeah, the, and there's more pain with protraction. In fact, what we find is acute AC separations is that um, you know, what we want to do at some point is when I'm doing forward raises, and I want to strengthen my anterior deltoids because it helps to stabilize the joint. And uh, what they find is that I can't do that normally, but if I hold my shoulder back, so I hold them in retraction, then I can do it. And why? Because retraction stabilizes the joint. And so we have them start that early, and then as they get better, they're able to do that with protraction. Wing test. What's that? Wing test. You guys going back and forth? Okay, it's wing <laughs> test, having you stand up and you go to say on this patient, up against the wall, sucker. And then I'm going to push on the spine. I'm looking for the winging of the uh, scapula from a serratus anterior weakness or paralysis. And again, you can do this in various degrees. He can protract against me and retract. So go ahead and protract and retract. And you can also have them do a true push-up against the wall. Good. And just observing the whole time to see if it's symmetrical. But with the wing test, it comes back. Allotment test. Allotment test, have you seen? Bouncing around. We're just going through all of them. I'm at I'm fine with that. So the allotment test, again, it's also called the shuck test. So you need to know where you're at. So that's the lunotriquetral dissociation. So I grab the lunate, and I grab the triquetrum, I do A to P, glide, and we're looking for clunking and pain. That's the lunate triquetral dissociation, which is the hyperdensibility. Next. No? Good? Finkelsteins. Finkelsteins, or Finkelsteins. There you go. It can be active or passive. So you're stretching into this direction when he's grabbing his thumb. So notice the distinction. Let's do it on this side. So here he's grabbing the thumb, that's going to stretch the tendon. Notice the difference between that and the scaphoid fracture test. It's really not that much different, it's just I'm relaxing those tendons. So I don't get confused between the two conditions. And so what we're doing here is we're stretching the anterior snuff-box muscles, which are tendons rather, which are which ones? Abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Right. Abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. And this is the extensor pollicis longus. Drummers. It's also called drummer boy's palm. You get problems here. This is the one, the Finkelstein's test. We call that the Quervain's disease. Typically responds quite well to grasping techniques.